Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and this week SpaceX has pushed the second Starship test tank to the limit with this incredible eruption of liquid nitrogen. The test pressure obtained here was exactly what was needed, so we're going to check that out in more detail along with other developments going on at Boca Chica, Texas. NASA made an incredible announcement saying that they have finally selected a commercial partner to provide HAB modules, which will actually become a temporary component to the International Space Station and kick off a whole new commercial space industry. And then just days ago, SpaceX launched Starlink 3, another incredible mission there with amazing footage, loads to explore today, so let's get stuck into it. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Early in the week, NASA announced that it had selected Axiom Space to provide at least one habitable commercial module which will be attached to the International Space Station. Now, we've known this opportunity has been on the cards for a while, but this is all starting to make it sound very official. It's going to be a game changer for the commercial space exploration and future space tourism industries. It will for the first time allow commercial astronauts to see Earth from a new perspective, from orbit. Something that less than 600 people in the history of the human race has ever experienced or seen before. This is also going to allow commercial launch providers such as SpaceX, Boeing and in the future companies such as Blue Origin to create a business including commercial scientific research missions and even tourism to take hold. Now last time I talked about tourism in low Earth orbit I had a a number of people commenting that were very skeptical about the available market considering costs to make such a trip. Will it start off super expensive? Sure. Initially we'll be seeing high profile people making these trips, but think about the publicity that comes from such people sharing this amazing experience with the world. This is no small thing. The world will be bombarded with stories of these experiences and from there I honestly believe that commercial tourism in space will become a viable market and that will change everything. The more commercial space stations and reusable launch vehicles are available, the cheaper it will all become. SpaceX's current goals of building a fully reusable Starship that could carry 100 people or more to orbit at a time is incredible in itself. Aspirationally, Elon Musk believes their super heavy launch vehicle and Starship could cost around $2 million per launch factoring in fuel and operational costs, which he talked about a few months ago at the first US Air Force Space Pitch Day. Now, obviously, there is a long way to go before we will know how true this could be. But if that works out to be true, a trip to space on this vehicle could be as low as $20,000 per seat, even less if the number of people on board are increased, which could certainly be possible in low Earth orbit missions. Plus, of course, accommodation costs at the future station as well. So yes, we're talking many years away for these sorts of costs. I'm just talking aspirationally here, but there's a massive market for people that would jump at the chance to do this once it's proven to be very safe with minimal risk. Even if the costs are double, triple, or even 10 times the price I'm talking here, this is incredible for such a once in a lifetime opportunity. As NASA has stated themselves, the selection of Axiom Space to provide one or more habitable commercial modules is a significant step towards enabling the development of independent commercial destinations that meet NASA's long-term needs in low Earth orbit. Now eventually the International Space Station itself will be decommissioned. We don't know exactly when this will be, but the technology is getting quite dated and it's not going to last forever. The plan with the Axiom modules long term is that they will be extended and built onto while attached to the International Space Station. The first module will attach to the station's Node 2 forward port. At the end of the International Space Station's life, the Axiom Station will detach and operate on its own into the future. A pretty amazing vision there and we can see some of these designs here that show what the station could end up becoming over time. NASA's administrator Jim Bridenstine said that Axiom's work to develop a commercial destination in space is a critical step for NASA to meet its long-term needs for astronaut training, scientific research and technology demonstrations in low Earth orbit. This will transform the way NASA works with industry to benefit the global economy and advance space exploration. It is a similar partnership that this year will return the capability of American astronauts to launch to the space station on American rockets from American soil. And of course there he is referring to the very exciting missions coming up for both SpaceX's Crew Dragon and Boeing's Starliner. 
Now, if you would like to know a little bit more about SpaceX's Crew Dragon progress, I've got a more in-depth video here about the recent in-flight abort test and future missions. And while you're here, please do consider subscribing. There is loads of news coming up with Starlink, Starship Development and Crew Dragon, and I'd love to share all that with you. So after a number of launch scrubs due to weather, the Starlink 3 mission launched a few days ago. Now, confusingly, this is actually the fourth batch of 60 Starlink satellites to launch. As I talked about in last week's video, the reason for this naming is the first set of 60 were considered version 0.9 satellites. Starlink 1, 2 and 3 are version 1s. Now very soon, SpaceX's Starlink network will be providing fast internet access globally. This is no small thing. The network will be a first of its kind. If Starlink can achieve the goals with this network, the internet service providers around the world will have some serious competition, especially with rural areas um, and underserved areas that are expensive. Now, all you will need is a Starlink terminal, which you'll just need to plug in, point at the sky, and then you'll be online. What's even better is that this could be used on mobile vehicles, boats, aircraft positioned almost anywhere in the world. This is going to be a game changer. Of course, from SpaceX's point of view, it'll provide a substantial new revenue stream that will allow them to accelerate that ultimate goal of colonizing Mars. Now this launch contains some of the most incredible launch and landing footage I've seen for quite a few months from SpaceX. I think this is probably the best live shot of a booster landing on the drone ship, period. It's just awesome stuff. After this launch, there are now around 240 Starlink satellites in orbit, and this is only the beginning with many more launches coming up this year. The mission was launched with the booster designated B1051, the same booster that launched Crew Dragon's Demo-1 mission, as well as the radar sat constellation last year. So that was the third flight for the booster and the second drone ship landing. And what a drone ship landing it was. This looked to hit the deck quite a bit harder than usual. You can actually see that the booster has cancelled out all of its vertical velocity in relation to the drone ship just a tad early. The engine shut down and it drops to the deck a little harder than usual. Incredible uninterrupted footage though, so it's quite rare considering the distance, roughly 630 kilometers downrange. Now both fairing capture ships Go Miss Tree and Go Miss Chief were deployed to attempt a double fairing catch. Miss Tree caught this one half, so awesome news there. Go Miss Chief apparently just narrowly missed the fairing, but was still able to recover it from the ocean. As we've seen with previous launches, the stack of 60 satellites were deployed in a single orbital plane at around 290 kilometers in altitude. Again, beautiful footage there. These satellites will be using their own onboard Krypton-powered iron thrusters to place themselves into their final resting orbit at around 550 kilometers in altitude. But they don't all start raising their orbits together. They will actually be splitting up into three groups of 20 into different orbital planes. I touched on this last week, but find it quite interesting how they do this. Essentially, satellite operators can control each set of 20 by raising their orbit and taking advantage of the Earth's equatorial bulge to alter the precession rates of the orbit and modify the longitude of the ascending node. This is all essentially very cheap from a fuel point of view, as groups of 20 can just sit in lower orbits while the initial sets are raised. They just need to wait until the correct time to begin raising the orbit. Obviously, when in a lower orbit, they will experience a little more drag, and they'll need a little more fuel to boost to that final resting orbit, but this, I believe, is minimal overall. So yes, interesting stuff there, but what is even more interesting is the amazing news from Starship Development at Boca Chica going on right now. My last video ended off showing the header tank and the nose cone undergoing testing. The next day, this had been tested to destruction, giving us some quite unique shots here. Early in the week, the second large test tank was rolled to the launch site. Very quickly, the tank was tested at room temperature, and this seemed to go very well. Quickly afterwards, Elon Musk tweeted saying that the 9 meter wide test tank made 7.5 bar at room temperature, and that there was a small leak, but that would be repaired and retested with cryogenic liquid. 8.5 bar of pressure is the requirement for a human rated vehicle, so this was getting very close. Tim Dodd got an official answer out of Elon shortly after asking if he was feeling confident enough in the welds and manufacturing to go ahead with the SN1 Starship build. Elon gave the thumbs up to that so everything was looking very positive. One of the more interesting parts to the conversation was in regards to the material strength in general. John here pointed out that the particular type of stainless steel being used is in fact at its weakest state at room temperature. Increasing or decreasing the temperature actually improves the strength. The next day, 
the repairs were done and SpaceX prepped the tank for the final test. The aim for this test was to push the tank to the limits to see what it could handle. Now, this footage here is captured by Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight. And if you're not subscribed to the channel already, there's a link for that in the description because they're generally the first to provide these incredible updates. Now, check this out. So yes, that was incredible. The tank looks to have ruptured around the ring segment as far as we can see here. Great news because it was the dome that was kind of the weak point before. I'll tell you what though, that was a spectacular wave of liquid nitrogen cascading over the site. I'm not sure if it immediately killed those floodlights or just obscured them, but the whole area was plunged into darkness there for a while. Elon afterwards confirmed the test tank had reached 8.5 bar of pressure or around 123 pounds per square inch. Inch. This is exactly what we wanted to see because the weakest points with the domes has been an issue hindering the developments of the Starship prototype builds for several months now. Elon tweeted a few weeks back saying that the 8.5 bar of pressure was the goal as that is the safety factor needed for crewed flight. So yes, they've already cleaned up the remains of the test tank so now it's over to the SN1 Starship which is already in progress. We'll be seeing some more substantial stacking going on over the next few weeks. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do take a second and hit that like button. A huge thank you to my quality control squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow my Discord or Twitter link in the description and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about the incredible Crew Dragon in-flight abort test results, along with a bunch of other topics such as Starlink and Starship development. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.